Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners, you can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month by going to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's adventure with Sam Spade. The original air date is February the 9th, 1951, and the title is The Sure Thing Caper. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam, a Mm. man named Five Dollar Frankie called up and said he's putting two dollars in your name on a sure thing at some track or other. Well, that's nice to hear. I don't think it is at all. You know I don't approve of your gambling, Sam. Effie, you do some things I disapprove of, but do I snipe at you? Well, no, but... No buts about it. And besides, I didn't place the bet. It was placed for me. I don't care. It's the principle of the thing I don't like. Well, suppose I put it this way, Effie. That $2 bet on a sure thing was more than just a money bet. It was a gamble on the inherent goodness of the human soul. Oh, Sam, you're just trying to confuse me. I am. But I'll straighten everything out to your satisfaction, I trust, when I appear at the office with a highly stylized and rather charming saga of horse players and the world they live in. What else but the sure thing caper? For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. I hope you always are at the wages I pay you. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up, Sam. When I pay them. I don't want to start an argument, but I do need some new clothes. Oh? You want me to put up a a good front, don't you? I will rephrase my answer. Yes. Well? Effie, if you can hold Warp and Wolf together for a few weeks, I have a feeling we'll be rolling in dough, driving big cars and wearing mink. Oh, you mean that best. All conjecture. Enough of your sneering. Now, you hear me out. Weigh the evidence, and maybe you'll feel differently. I doubt it. No good comes of playing the horses. Date, fill it in. Two $5 Frankie, care of... Uh... Sam, wait a minute now. Hmm? $5 Frankie what? What's his last name? I don't think he has one, F. As I get it, he was born just before a gold cup handicap at Pimlico, and they didn't have time to give him a last name and place a bet, too. So they chose the bet. Oh, Sam, that's awful. What do you mean, awful? That horse paid 18 to 1. Well... Well, to get on, two five-dollar Frankie, care of Patterson Smoke Shop, Myrtle Street, City, from Samuel Sucker Spade, San Francisco, license number 137596. Subject, the sure thing caper. Dear five-dollar Frankie, for you to be seen at the hour of 1 p.m. post time anywhere but at the track is truly a veritable, unbelievable occurrence. So when my door pivoted open Monday at said hour and a short gent with 36 shoulders and a 44 long plaid coat came in, my eyes told me it was you, but my mind screamed, no. I checked your wide brim pork pie, your zoot gabardine slacks, suede and alligator wingtip shoes, and it still repeated, you, you, you. Sammy, do not look as if you have just lamped a ghost. It is I. Five dollar Frankie. But at this hour, Frankie, what is it? Your watch broken? Did you lose your way? You sleepwalking? What? No, Sam. I am in complete possession of my faculties. Good. And I came here with the full knowledge of my intellect. Uh Uh-huh. I even see through the crystal of my timepiece that it is one o'clock, the hour from which they break from the barrier. That's right. But I have not been drinking, and as far as sleepwalking, that is strictly for gents with unhappy marital relationships. All right, Frankie, I'm forced to agree with you that you are standing in front of me instead of the $5 window. Now, what's the dope? 
Well, ordinarily, I do not resort to hiring a strong arm to consummate my business dealings. Naturally. There being a full supply of such muscles lying around the back room of Patterson's smoke shop. Loose. But when the job calls for both tact and muscle, I am forced to roam far abroad in search of the same. You mean you have a job for me? A real honest to see this good job that'll pay money? Now, with the ordinary Seamus, I might try to offer a little paddock chatter, you know? Yes. But with you, Sammy, with you, I will tend the coin of the realm. Good. I will pay you, of course, in five dollar bills, as is my wont. In advance? Ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. Ten times five. Figures. Now, do you veritably consider yourself in my employ? I am veritably in the race, Frankie. Good. Now, Sammy, leave it to be understood by both parties that I am not touting you off on any sour deals. Mm -hmm. A rather curious situation has arisen, and I will explain it to you candidly, as they say in certain novels which I have not read. Well, most novels lose so much in the translation. True, true. Yeah. My narrative begins yesterday, to be exact. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, their heels and toes into the back room of Patterson's smoke shop, a gent whose face was once as familiar to me as my own. By name, said gent? They call him a Gentle Joe Higgins. Gentle Joe. Yeah, a horse trainer by profession, mm-hmm. which in our civilized society stands second only to jockeys in importance. Granted, granted, no argument. Well, I say to Gentle Joe, it has been some time, Gentle Joe, since I see you around and about. Mm-hmm. And he says, I have gave up the old life for the new as I no longer am welcome at the track since a certain embarrassing incident five years ago. What incident was that, Frankie? A horse doping job, the illegal type, oh. which uh, depresses me to relate. You know? mm-hmm. So I will not. Ethics. Yeah. yeah. Well, Gentle Joe looks a little worse for the wear, his clothing being literally shabby. Mm-hmm. Oh, I figure a touch, and I am preparing a story that will wring tears from a tax collector even. But? But? Gentle Joe does not mention the word touch. Uh Uh-huh. Instead, he announces he has a sure thing. Mm. Sammy, you know how those words do to a horse player. It's like throwing a bale of catnip to a lion. Oh, my arteries open to let the blood through faster. My, 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 my nerves give off loud ringing noises, and my mind is already computing. Of course. Well, before I can stop myself, I have pressed 500 rocks in Gentle Joe's hand begging him to place them on the same sure thing. I'd have done the same thing under the circumstances. Of course. But Gentle Joe says it will take at least 1,500 rocks to pull off the deal. Oh. He further advises me that the horse in question is due to retain 20 rocks to one. So you gave him the other thousand? Well, not having it in my genes at the time, I cut two other business and professional friends in on the gravy. Mm-hmm. Dinosaur Torelli and Bones Moulton. Five bills apiece. And then... Gentle Joe rushes out of Patterson's and... Has never been heard from again. A sad tale. You think he just stole the money? Sam, Gentle Joe Higgins is a horse player, not a common sneak thief. I'm sorry, sorry. But uh, did he leave town? He did not. On the advice of certain informers, I tracked this Gentle Joe to a ramble shackle rooming house on Clark Street. Uh, 241, to be exact. And? And there the trail gets very cold. Very cold indeed. He's made his move, huh? No, no, no. But he had a landlady who would not let me in. Complicated. Oh, she is a frightening person to behold. Hmm? She is indeed half wildcat and half witch. I'll deal with her. Good, good. And uh, tell Gentle Joe that... I am not an overly suspicious person, but uh, also relate to him my position. Hmm? Mm-hmm. Dinosaur Torelli and Bones Moulton are two such gents as it is wise not to cross. Rough. Back fence gossip has it they are the undertaker's best friend. Well. Indeed, it is also rumored they are behind their quota for the month. Mm. Well, oh, and uh, Sam. Yeah? At Bay Meadows. Yeah? A bad card. Nothing going today. Oh. <laughs> In preparation for my meeting with this redoubtable landlady, I ran through my repertoire of low, mean faces in front of the mirror, leaving smoking holes in the glass. And then I stamped out, heading for the rooming house on Clark Street, 241 to be exact. My knock was answered by... Well, it was even worse than you told me. She was gumming a sen-sen. What are you standing there for? You're shaking my geraniums. Oh, no. 
Well, sir... Speak up, speak up, Curly. I ain't got old days. Madam, perchance do you house in this quaint colonial inn a fine old gentleman called Gentle Joe Higgins? You the Lord? No, I'm in business for myself. You see this? Oh, one thing I hate worse than the Lord is private detectives. Hmm. Can't trust them. No, cheap. Never have any money. Hey, look. Never want to pay anything. Yes, look. Always want something for nothing. You... A surly, no good lot of pocket pickers who should all be boiled in oil right and good. thrown in a pit full of snarling. Uh, one moment, of madam. Madam, look at this. Oh, yeah. well. <laughs> that's kind of crinkling I'd like to hear. I thought you would. <laughs> Wouldn't mind having a mattress to pull that green paper. <laughs> it is a pleasure, distinctly, to be able to present it to such a charming, witty, and gay woman, I guess, as yourself. Now, uh. Come in, come in, bright eyes. Yes. Now, uh, where did you say Gentle Joe could be located? Second door to the left. Thank you kindly. Only he ain't in. Gone up somewhere, yes. Your timing, madam, and I should add Defarge, was a little sadistic. Now, give me my five back. You ain't heard my proposition yet. I've heard enough. Madam, you have acted in a very hateful manner. <laughs> Another five. I'll let you wait in his room. Madam... You are a Dresden doll, no matter what anybody says. Can the chatter away, you lost, and let's go. <laughs> let's have a ball. Once in Gentle Joe's room, I closed the door, thus separating myself from that skid row bank head. While I was waiting, I cased the room. Spartan, a bed, a chair, a dresser, a racing form, some worn clothes, various mementos and pictures of his better days at the track. I was studying an old print of equipoise when Gentle Joe turned up. <laughs> yes, he was a great stretch runner, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, indeed. A mile and 141 and fifth and hardly damp at the end. Well, I... Uh, <laughs> yes. Now, don't, yes. don't look upset, Mr. Spade. Hmm? Fanny, Fanny told me that you were a detective waiting for her. Oh, she's a swell kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Fanny's impetuous, but a good sort, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keeps the right people out and lets the wrong ones in. <laughs> a fine judge of character. No, you're generous, sir. I'm uh, about to have a cup of tea. Will you join me? Be delighted. I'll uh, just take the water out of the tap. <laughs> it's hot enough. <laughs> well, well, gentle Joe, I'm uh, I'm here on a rather painful mission. How in goes the tea? Uh, five dollar Frankie thinks you caged him out of fifteen hundred dollars. And now for the water. And uh, two tough friends of his are looking for your scalp. Yeah, well, there we are. Uh. Now we'll just let that steep a while, and we'll have us a pickup. Did you hear anything I said? Well, of course, Mr. Spence, of course. Every word. I know why you're here. Those men are worried about their money. Yes. But uh, next time you see them, you tell them not to worry. Well, they said uh, this sure thing of yours was going to return 20 to 1 odds. That's a lot of money. Oh, it will. It will. All of that. Maybe even many times more. Yeah, yes, it's a sure thing. You mean the race hasn't been run off yet? Yeah, there we are now. I think the tea should be ready. Well, mm -hmm. Tommy. Now, this is yours. Thank you. And this is mine. Uh -huh. Ah, <clears throat> ah a Darjeeling flowering pico. There's no finer tea. Has an almond flavor. Yes, it's peculiar to the region, mm -hmm. especially pronounced in last year's crop. Yes. Well, um, shall we get back to business? Yes, now you tell those gentlemen that they have no need to fret about their money. It'll be returned to them many times over, many, many times over. <laughs> Are you feeling all right, Mr. Spain? Groggy, I am. They'll look back on this investment with considerable pleasure and pride. I don't know what And happened. someday they'll be able to say that they, too... <laughs> Stupid Sam. Nobody had to give me a saliva test to guess what happened. That nice, sweet, gentle old man had doped me right up to the ears. I tried to stand up, but my legs were like two wet pieces of spaghetti, and I went down. Gentle Joe went right on talking and smiling until everything was nothing. When I came to, Joe was gone, and so was my faith in horse people. Fanny had made herself scarce, too, and I stumbled alone out into the daylight for resuscitation. It took walking, coffee, whiskey, and a bowl of raspberries to bring me around. I eventually found a safe haven in my own office. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Mr. 
Mr. Hangover. Uh, Mr. Spade, this is Gentle Joe. What? Listen, you... Uh, I, I know, I know how upset you must be over my little deception. Little but, uh, deception? It was Why? all to a good purpose, Mr. Spade. You see, I had to get out of there in a hurry with the minimum of discussion. I seem to remember you were hustled out of the racing game for doping a few three-year-olds. Well, that's what some people in official circles felt. But, Mr. Spade, I want to apologize to you and tell you that I will be able to explain everything to your satisfaction. No. No. What's the matter? Help. Get away! Ah! Hello! 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 Somebody put the phone back on the hook, so I hung up and dialed a friend at the telephone exchange. She quickly placed the number. The call came from the Sunset Stables out near Bay Meadows. I dialed back, but nobody answered, so I beat it out there. It was dark, and the only person I could rouse was a young stable boy. Yeah, what do you want? My name's Spade. A guy named General Joe was calling me from here, and something happened to him. General Joe Higgins? That's what I said. Oh, I haven't seen him in two or three years. Now, look, don't give me that. He called from here. Now, where is he? Oh, look, beat it, will you, before I scream for the cops? All right, I'll look myself. Oh, I say you can't. Now, no. But I did. There were two phones inside the stable, both hanging on posts. The second one had the number the phone company had given me. And although someone had tried to cover it up with sawdust, on the floor, under the phone, were three tea bags. And somebody had done a lot of bleeding. Looked like Gentle Joe's parlay had run out. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and mystery on NBC every Saturday night. For music tomorrow, your hit parade brings you the top tunes in the land as selected by you and presented by Raymond Scott's orchestra, Snooky Lanson and Eileen Wilson. For mystery tomorrow, Herbert Marshall stars as the man called... Hear him tomorrow night. Now back to the sure thing, Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I collared the stable boy and questioned him about the blood under the phone and about what could have happened to Gentle Joe Higgins. Nothing. Just wouldn't talk and he was too small to beat up. So I went looking for the stable manager. He lived in a small white house behind the exercise ring. He wasn't too happy at being awakened, but when I explained things, he came down to the stable with me. I can't understand it, Mr. Spade. General Joe Higgins hasn't been around here for at least two years. That's what the boy told me. You see, for doping a horse once, he can't come near a track or a stable. We let him hang around here, the racing commission would find us. Well, he called from here and something happened to him. The number the phone company gave me matches up with one of your phones. There was a lot of blood on the floor, too. Well, here we are. Now, which phone was it? That one. All right, let's look at it. This is the phone, and here is a... Wait a minute. Come in here, you. Let go of me, you big... Here. Oh. Now, tell Mr. Kemp here what was on the floor when I came in. Nothing. Nothing but sawdust. I tell you, there was blood there. No, no, honest, nothing. Mr. Spade, this boy's been with me for five years. He's perfectly reliable. Well, so am I. Well, what do you think happened? I think somebody used this old man for a punching bag. Maybe you'd better go home and sleep on it, Mr. Spade. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Well, don't humor me. Make this kid talk. Oh, Mr. Kemp, this guy's tappy. Danny, are you certain there was no blood or no gentle Joe? Mr. Kemp... I'd swear on my father's grave if necessary. You see, Mr. Spade? I calmed down in a little while and searched the place myself. I came up with exactly nothing but an attack of hay fever and a horsey smell. And I suddenly wondered why I cared about Gentle Joe at all after what he'd done to me. So I went home and called Five Dollar Frankie. You say you have conversed with Gentle Joe? Twice, and both under rather trying circumstances, Frankie. Once I was doped, and once something happened to him. Uh-huh. I take it he did not heed the message I employed you to convey. So far, he hasn't heeded anything. Ah, uh, then he is without a doubt in considerable trouble. I would say so. It seems that my business associates, Dinosaur Torelli and Bones Moulton, have blown their tops and gone looking for Gentle Joe with something special in mind. Mm -hmm. Something like assassination. I was afraid of that. Mayhaps they have already contacted Gentle Joe for an accounting. Certainly, mayhaps. I think they've already mowed him down. And there is nothing further for us to converse about, Sam. 
It is history, and it will be recorded thusly. Well, if you say so. And if I might tender a bit of advice, mm. I would say, hop into the Simmons, Sammy, and knock yourself off a few hours of that ever-loving forgetfulness. And when you arise, you will have erased from your mind the names of gentle Joe Higgins and yours truly $5 Frankie for some time to come. I was tired, and it seemed smart to take his advice. So I did. I went to bed. It must have been three in the morning when something woke me up. It was a ghost with a big white head tiptoeing into my room. The thought was so absurd that I turned over and started back to sleep. That's when the ghost touched me and I grabbed for him. Wait, hey, let me go, Mr. Spade. Let me go. It's me, General Joe. Will I turn on a light? <laughs> Of course, I look a little different. Yeah. The bandages around my head look like a turban. What happened to you? I was in Mr. Kemp's house when you were searching the stable. Stupid me. I should have come out then, but I didn't. Mm. And then I got to thinking I certainly owed you some kind of an explanation. So I found your address and came here. All right, I'll collect the explanation. Now, first, what was the dope for? Well, I was afraid you might take me back to $5 Frankie and his friends before I did what I had to do. Would you care to tell me what that was? I wanted to buy a horse. With their money? Yes, with their money. They thought you were betting it on a horse, a sure thing. I know, I know, but let me explain. I was thrown off the tracks for doping a horse. I needed money, but that's, that's another story. After five years, I could get my trainer's license back. Tell me more. Do you know what it is to love horse flesh and not be able to go near it for five years? No, the bangtail bug never got me. You can't con guys like Frankie and his thugs out of some money to buy a horse whenever you want one. There's more to the story. The horse I doped didn't get into the race. And the jockey had to ride another mount. He was thrown and killed. Well, it was too bad. I felt that I'd murdered the man. His name was Sandy Bean. Sandy Bean? Is that stable boy at Sunset Stables any relative? His son. Oh. His wife and son ran out of money and they've had a hard time of it. I've worked as a janitor for the past five years trying to raise enough money to buy them a horse uh -huh. to help make up for what I did. How much did you save? Only $1,500. The horse I wanted, a two-year-old named Sure Thing, cost $3,000. Well, things are beginning to clear up now. How did you figure you could take money from Frankie to buy it? Well, Frankie and his friends made a lot of money off Sandy Bean when he rode. I figured it wouldn't hurt them to pay a little of it back. Well, I don't think they'd see it that way. I wasn't stealing the money. I was going to give each of them a 10% of the horse. I, I didn't dare tell it until after I bought it. Mm -hmm. Well, Gentle Joe, maybe they'll see the light, but I doubt it. I was going to take 10% for training her, give the other 60 to Mrs. Bean and her son Danny. Mm. He'll make a good jockey. And sure thing is a great horse. I know, I know. They'll make a lot of money off of it. It's a noble plan. Tomorrow my five years is up, and I wanted to give them the horse then. I see. Who roughed you up when I was talking to you on the phone? Danny was backing a horse into the stable, and it got excited. It started kicking, and I was in the way. I thought maybe you'd been done in. I know. That's why I came to see you and explain things. Can you do anything to help me? Well, I... All right, everybody, huh? just stand where we are. There's no need to wave a gun around here. Get up, you... Gentle Joe, we've been looking for you around in a box. Now, now, dinosaur, now hey, look. Here I... we wish to hear from you, Joe. Come along. Look, you're not going to take him out of here without a fight. And we wouldn't mind this at all, and as much as we come equipped with a little artillery. Bones. Bones, I didn't steal that money. Shut up. <laughs> all right, all right, knock it off. You want some of the sand? Yeah, if you think you can do it. <laughs> and it turned out they could. I knocked Torelli's gun aside, hit him with a hard left, and he didn't go down. I tried a right, then a knee, then a couple of elbows. And I was just getting ahead of the game when something hit me across the face and printed Code 45 on my forehead. I know this sounds repetitious, but I went out again. Honest, I did. Really. I'm sorry. Appropriately, it was dawn when I woke up cold and headachy. Of course, I was alone. Gentle Joe Higgins was the victim of a successful snatch, and I had an idea what might have happened to him. I dressed and started looking all over town, but I didn't have any luck, any. It wasn't until I was eating breakfast and met a police sergeant I know that I got a tip. Morning, Sam. Hello, Sergeant. What happened to you? I tried to kiss her. Ah, I didn't know they made those camp dams anymore. Why don't I sit out? Pleasure. Yeah. Well, we got a homicide this morning. Yeah, who? Who knows? Just an old man. Found him in the park. Somebody really worked him over. Well, what do you look like? Who? 5'10", white hair, old clothes. Probably a bum. Where is he, Mord? Yeah. Kelsey's putting a rundown on him now. 
Yeah, well, I'll see you later, Carter. Thanks. Hey, Sam, haven't finished your breakfast. They let me in the morgue, and I took a look at the corpse. And once I saw it, I knew just where I had to go. I caught a cab out to the Sunset Stable. The horses were just having their rolled oats when I pulled in, and Danny Bean, the stable boy, was there, dressed in his cleanest Levi. What do you want? Where's the show going to be? Uh, what show? Well, General Joe gives you the horse, isn't this the day? Okay, so you know. Mm-hmm. Gee, I'm sorry about last night, Mr. Spade. I had to keep it a secret. Forget it, forget it. You did the right thing. When's the ceremony? In about an hour, right here. You want to wait? Sure, sure. I wouldn't miss it for the world. Of course, I cheated a little. I didn't tell you who it was I saw in the morgue. The truth was, I didn't know. It wasn't gentle Joe Higgins, though. And so I reasoned thusly, if Torelli and Moulton didn't finish him off in the night, he must have gotten out of it somehow. He was a resourceful old man, and I was sure nothing short of death would keep him from presenting Danny with a horse on the day he planned. And I was right. An hour later, he came walking in, leading the prettiest chestnut mare I'd ever seen. And with a smile two feet wide on his face. And behind him, carrying blankets, a saddle, and riding colors, were who else? Five dollar Frankie, Dinosaur Torelli, and Bones Moulton. Well, well, Mr. Spade, this is a surprise. Well, it's a pleasant one. Yeah, this is your sure face. Oh, isn't she a beauty? She huh? is indeed. How'd you do it, Gentle Joe? Well, Mr. Spade, I uh, just invited them over to my place to have a cup of tea. You get it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. While we was a half out, he explained the whole thing to us. Sound like a good deal to me. We can win both ways. You're not checking at the window. Oh, look at the life of that horse. Just waiting to cross the finish line. Sammy boy, this is indeed a signal occasion. Huh? This is the first time I have ever been this close to a horse. Mm-hmm. And me being a horse player. Well, have you talked to her yet? Why, sure. I am already talking to Sure Thing and explain to her our financial position. Oh. She has assured me she will romp home first more times than not. Well, gentlemen, shall we do what we came here to do? Sure. Leave us make the present. Come on, come on. Let's get into business. Give huh? the animal to the kid already. I agree. Danny? Yes, Mr. Higgins? Danny, the four of us are giving you this horse, Sure Thing... In memory of your father, the late, great Sandy B. Thank you. Thank you, sir. She's a beauty, isn't she? I feel like I was just born. Ride her well, son. Ride her well. And I think he will. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam. I... It was so beautiful. A simple, old-fashioned type story, F. We feel we can use one now and then. And I'm glad nothing happened to anybody. Mm. Because I just loved them all. Everything considered, F, they weren't half bad. Now, uh, how about typing it up? Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's music and fun in the air tomorrow evening, styled to suit your Saturday night of merriment. Dennis Day brings you songs and comedy in his charming boyish manner, and then Judy Canova gets together with her frolicsome friends for Mountain Melody and Mayhem, followed by Grand Ole Opry with singing MC Red Foley and his gang. It's a Saturday night of fun designed for you. Let me see now. Mm-hmm. You captured five dollar Frankie's peculiar style. Perfect. And that wasn't easy. Oh, Sam, I was just thinking. Oh? We ought to contribute something along with everybody else. To that horse, you know, that sure thing. I probably will, Effie. A few dollars here, a few there, whenever it's running. Oh, I didn't mean betting. Oh. What I meant is, for example, it's um it's gonna need a lot of hay, isn't it? Bales and bales. Well, my cousin Frisbee cuts our lawn. I'll have him save the grass and send it to the stable. Effie, you are a noble creature, but I think sure thing can get along without your little lawn. Well, I've seen horses wearing stockings. Couldn't I knit a pair? Two pair. Two pair. But F, let's not lose our heads. Five dollar Frankie and his pals will take good care of sure thing. How about worrying about taking care of me? All right, Sam. Yes. Could you use some grass or some socks? Effie, knock off this horse talk, will you? We're almost at the wire now, and people are just champing at the bit for the payoff. <laughs> All right, Sam. Let's finish neck and neck, huh? Hmm, why not? Come here, sure thing. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs>
The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Wally Mayer was Gentle Joe. Script for tonight's adventure by John Michael Hayes. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. The fight against heart disease, the greatest killer in America, goes on with increased intensity. But doctors cannot wage this battle alone. They need your help for the eventual control of heart disease through research, education, and community heart programs. Give now to fight heart disease. Send your contribution to HEART, H-E-A-R-T, in care of your nearest post office. Join the magnificent Montague, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC. Welcome back. A very uh, Damon Runyon-esque story. Uh, that's the obvious inspiration for this sort of tale. And you will hear these throughout the 1950s, as well as see them. There was even a TV episode of Mr. and Mrs. North that used a group of gamblers and a baby, and it, it definitely has that same sort of vibe. If you want to experience more of these sort of stories, you might enjoy the Damon Runyon Theater, which was a syndicated radio series that adapted Damon Runyon's short stories. Of course, we get another really good performance from Wally Mayer, and uh, his performances in the episodes where he's been the featured guest star, and I'm particularly thinking of the Dry Gulch Caper, really serve to highlight just how talented and how special of a performer he was, as he is getting a nice variety of parts. Now, the one problem with a story like this is there's not really a whole lot for Sam to do. The only thing they can think of to do with Sam is to have him hit on the head, and they decide for good measure to do that twice. Well, we turn to listener comments and feedback now, and I have an email from Caleb who writes... Adam, hope you and yours are doing well. I, too, am sad to see Tales of the Texas Rangers leave. When I first started listening to old-time radio on uh, Sirius, I must have heard an episode of the show that was set well into the past, so I thought it was more of a Western and didn't really seek it out after that. However, when you started playing it, I realized my error, and it became one of my favorite shows. And to be fair... I've been listening to a lot more Westerns as well since then. Thanks for playing it. Here's a random question. Let's say you were kidnapped, choosing that instead of more morbid options. Which old-time radio detective that has been on this podcast would you want to track you down and rescue you? Would the answer change if there had to be a fist fight, shootout to rescue you? That's a good question. Honestly, I think I'd have to put it into two categories. Uh, and I'd put those who were official agents of the law and those who aren't. Because if I had a choice, I would want someone with all the official authority and abilities that come with being in law enforcement. So for me, it would be Jace Pearson. I always will love Joe Friday, but... I go with Jace Pearson just because he's developed a, a great sense of resourcefulness and abilities to operate alone or in cooperation with local agencies. Plus, if I were to be kidnapped around here, I would probably be taken to some rural, out-of-the-way place, somewhere in the woods or in the desert. I doubt I'd get one of those nice kidnappers. You know, they take you up to like a real nice Airbnb and McCall, DVD player, all that. I'm not getting that. Eh? If I'm getting kidnapped, I'm being dragged out into the woods or into the desert. 
And in that case, Jace Pearson gets the edge. Now, if I have to go with the non-official, that's tough. I mean, on one hand, there are certain people I would not want to. Like, if I were to be kidnapped, I would not want my wife to call Jonathan Keg of a life in your hands. I mean, she'd call him up and he'd say something like, that's horrible. I will act as an amicus curiae, which means friend of the court. In that capacity... I work for neither the prosecution or the defense, but I can ask questions in order to get at the truth. And when informed that that wouldn't do any good, I mean, all he could offer to do is if I turned up dead to appear at the coroner's inquest. Uh, so no, I, I wouldn't call in Jonathan Keg. Or those detectives with dubious track records where they're always sent out to find a missing person and then they turn up dead. I would probably end up going with Dan Holliday. Dan is very resourceful. He's an outside-the-box thinker and has shown he can handle himself in a lot of different situations. Of course, there's also Johnny Dollar, but if Johnny Dollar were called in, that would be something that my insurance company would do. And I'm a little dubious that I am well insured enough for my insurance company to care enough to hire a big-time investigator. So if I couldn't have Jace Pearson looking for me, it definitely would be Dan Holiday. I'd like Johnny Dollar, but I'm not holding my breath. Well, unless the kidnappers made me do it for some reason. Like they got bored and decided to do a how long can you hold your breath challenge. But not in the figurative sense. I wouldn't be figuratively holding my breath. Well, that was a fun email. Thank you so much. And now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead ahead and thank Chuck. Chuck has been one of our Patreon supporters since September of 2022, currently supporting the program at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Chuck. And that will do it for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download us from. We will be back next Monday with another episode of Sam Spade, but coming up tomorrow, it's the start of another Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial where... Oh, look, start all over again, will you, Harry? Yes. No, on second thought, perhaps you were right. Perhaps you'd better get the details directly from Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly, Kelly Man Pyton, I know. Now, look, Harry, I, I think I'd better. I'd better get it from somebody. You're Incidentally, not... John, you understand, of course, that your services will be required only during the affair at Bala Kinwood. And not one minute there. No, thereafter. I don't understand. What's Bala Kinwood? Out around Westchester, outside the city, one of the suburbs. Very nice suburb, too. That is where Leia Douglas Douglas... Have here this coat. Yes, John, that is where he will appear. And you or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, or both, if you think his life will be in danger. Exactly. Oh, John, I knew you were just joking me all the time. I wish I knew. Uh, here we are, and everything will be clear. Yeah. Oh, thank heavens, dear Mr. Branson. I was afraid something had happened to you. You were gone so long. You really had me quite worried. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I had hoped to tell Mr. Dollar something of this affair, and I'm afraid we loitered on the way up. Uh, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, this is Mr. John Dollar. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I'm so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. You see, Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me. And I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but where is he? Uh, why, yes, Mrs. Van Pyten, what's happened to him? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, my dear. He's all right. But after all, he is so temperamental. I fear he got a bit impatient waiting for you. And I know you'll forgive him. You will, won't you? Yes, yes, of course, but where is he? He's asleep, Mr. Branson, in your inner office. He sat down in your chair and fell fast asleep. Oh, if I could only relax that way. But you must meet him, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I'd certainly like to. Of course you would, and I know he'll want to meet you. Gently now. Oh, good, he's awake. Oh, no. That's Laird... Laird Douglas, Douglas of Heather... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. 
Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.